about six, seven years ago, probably. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi, I mean, it was one of the most memorable uh, trips that I had. And um, it's a blessing to be with you here. And I know that in settings like this, Q&A is far more valuable. Uh, so I won't speak for too long. Inshallah ta'ala, I'll offer some remarks on this concept that I hope will be a little bit different or at least enriching to what you already have heard about when it comes to sabr, when it comes to patience, and when it comes to this, this beautiful ayah or two ayahs in the Qur'an. Inna ma'ala usri yusra, inna ma'ala usri yusra. Verily with difficulty comes ease, verily with difficulty comes ease. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to take a show of hands. I mean, how many of you feel like the khutbas and the lectures in the last two years have revolved around this concept? Have you all heard a lot of khutbas about difficulty? Yeah? Okay. One of the things that I see with this discourse is that a lot of this comes down to whether or not you're going to apply some of these basic concepts from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in regards to how to show sabr. You know, if you think about it, at the end of the day, when you're talking to someone that's going through a hardship, it's a lot easier for you to find the words to give to them than it is for you to actually express them in a heartfelt way when you're in the midst of a difficulty. And that's why, subhanAllah, the, the, the blessing of simply saying Alhamdulillah, the blessing of simply praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying Alhamdulillah, when you are in difficulty, is in and of itself enough to build you a home in paradise. It's not this long prayer that you have to say. It's not something that's elaborate or comprehensive. It is one phrase in the midst of difficulty that at the first strike, in the sadmat al-ula, to say alhamdulillah is enough to have a home built in paradise called the house of praise, alhamdulillah. You don't have to do much more, right? It's not complicated. You don't have to sit there and think about what you, uh, what you remember. And you know, it was really interesting when I think about how simple that is and how beautiful it is. I had a friend of mine who was in a really bad car accident. And this is what I think about when I think of this hadith and the simplicity of it. Uh, and in the midst of this car accident, when they got to him, they started asking, they said, what's your phone number? And he couldn't remember his phone number, right? Or a phone number of, of uh, a family member or a friend, right? When you're in the midst of it, there's a level of shock, right? And he said, the only thing I kept on saying was, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So I forgot my phone number. I forgot my phone number, but I didn't forget, Alhamdulillah. Because the believer is so accustomed to constant hamd, to constantly saying Alhamdulillah, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you hope that when the test comes, that that will be your natural first instinct. But in order for it to be your natural first instinct, it has to be your regular habit. The same thing as this dream that we all have, that Allah takes us saying what? What do you want to be saying when you die? La ilaha illallah. See, all y'all said it. You want death to get to you while you are saying la ilaha illallah. May Allah give us all that ability to say la ilaha illallah at the time of death. May Allah make it our last words on our tongue and in our heart. You're not suddenly going to come up with la ilaha illallah if it wasn't a regular dhikr. You know, if, if you think about the Prophet ﷺ when he says, keep your tongue moist, keep your mouth moist with la ilaha illallah. Keep your mouth moist with la ilaha illallah. Right? As a form of remembrance. What a blessing from the Prophet ﷺ to teach us something so simple, yet so profound. Because if you are accustomed, if you train your tongue to while, when you are walking, from place to place, walking to class, going somewhere else. You're saying, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, constantly moving your tongue with it. Then when that moment comes to you of death, whether it is sudden or if it is at the end of a long extended trial, la ilaha illallah will be natural for you because you've made it a habit to constantly say la ilaha illallah. So it's very simple things with huge rewards. To say Alhamdulillah at the time of musibah, at the time of tragedy, guarantees you what? A house of praise in paradise. To say La ilaha illallah at the time of death, guarantees you entrance into paradise. Because the Prophet said, whoever dies and La ilaha illallah is their last words, dakhla al-jannah, you will enter into paradise. That's why Allah doesn't give it to anybody. It's a special gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to you. What Muslim doesn't know Alhamdulillah and La ilaha illallah? We all know it. You could talk to a Muslim, 
that is thoroughly educated and deep in the faith, or you could talk to a very simple Muslim that lives somewhere in the third world in a desert cut off from people. What Muslim doesn't know to say Alhamdulillah for good things and Alhamdulillah in times of patience and La ilaha illallah at all times. Every Muslim knows that. So Allah is not giving us a difficult equation here. It's whether or not you can bring yourself to actually say it in the moment. Now, uh, I gave a khutbah about this a few weeks ago. Sabr, the short term of sabr, and the sadmat al-ula, the first strike is to say alhamdulillah. The long term determination of patience is whether or not you're making progress in your relationship to Allah. The long term is whether or not you're making progress in your relationship to Allah. So are you succeeding in the short term? Did you say Alhamdulillah when it happened? Or did you shout out a bunch of you know curse words or say a bunch of things you shouldn't have said? And then when you cooled down, you said Alhamdulillah. The long term of it is measure your patience by your progress. That's the long term. Okay. Now I want to come back to this ayah. Inna ma'al usri yusra. I was thinking about this ayah as much as I could. What's an angle? What's something that we can extract from it that is not already obvious from the ayah itself? That verily with hardship comes ease or with difficulty comes ease. Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it twice, right? He repeats it. With hardship comes ease. I can't tell you how many times I've been invited to give a khutbah or a lecture at a university and they said, what's your topic? I said, what's your topic? What's my topic? With hardship comes ease, all right? No offense to direct, so I'm going to say. You guys could have been a little bit more creative here. <laughs> but uh, in reality though, the Qur'an as a whole offers us an opportunity for infinite reflection. Like you don't stop reflecting on the Qur'an. You don't stop extracting gems from the Qur'an. So there's actually beauty in the fact that these few phrases stick with us because they become part of the ethos of the Muslims. It becomes who we are. With hardship comes ease. In the matter of yusra, in the matter of yusra. So what does this refer to? The word usur is a very interesting word. All right, difficulty. Usur is a very different different word. And of course, in the Arabic language, uh, you have such a rich, you know, spectrum of words to define seemingly a singular concept that each one of them offers you a lot of benefit. And so there's the word mashaka, mashaka. And mashaqqa, typically the scholar...